Uh, let's uh, get into the word this morning. There is hope. Come on, turn to your neighbor and just say, there is hope. 2,700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah gives a hope-filled message in the midst of really difficult times. And it's this, Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And then just like Isaiah prophesied some 700 years after that, man, hope came. Jesus came. The Messiah came. And, and, and so what we've been doing is we've been looking at Jesus in this series as the fulfillment of everything Isaiah prophesied. So it's Jesus as our wonderful counselor. Jesus as our mighty God. Jesus as our everlasting Father. And today we'll be concluding with a message, Jesus as our Prince of Peace. Now, of course, Isaiah did not say the words Prince of Peace because those are English words. Uh, in Hebrew, Isaiah would have said this, Sar Shalom. Sar, come on, just to say that, it's fun. Say Sar Shalom. Yeah, Sar Shalom. Uh, sar is the Hebrew word for prince, but it's actually more than that. It's the, it's the captain, the general. Uh, the one who's in charge. Even the Romans picked this up. Think of Caesar, right? It's the one who's in charge. And then you have the word shalom. Shalom is where we get our word peace. But really, shalom means a lot more than just peace. It's, it's rest. It's tranquility. It's wholeness, completeness, harmony. Parkwood, Jesus is our Sar Shalom. He is the captain of rest. He's the Lord of tranquility. He's the general of wholeness and harmony. And he's come uh, to bring peace to this world. I mean, this is the message that we give almost every single Christmas, that he's come to bring peace to this world. But it's important that we understand that our world, as it is today, in form and function, was not always like this. Our world was not always broken. See, in the very beginning, God made it good. He made it, it's the word here, he made it shalom. And this shalom, this, this peace that God created, uh, really at the beginning was without fracture, it was without uh, any mistakes whatsoever. It, it was absolute shalom. And we see this shalom on three different levels. Humanity, Adam and Eve in the beginning, they were at peace with creation, with one another, and with God. Let me explain that. Okay, humanity was at peace with creation. Okay, the ground, it just produced food. And they would reap of that food without labor or toil or sweat or blood or tears. It was, it was just there. I mean, the environment was a perfectly safe place for them to live. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's no germs. N none of that existed in Shalom. Humanity was at perfect peace. You even have this scene of Adam naming the animals, right? Animals that you and I today would be in great conflict with. Adam stands right next to unafraid and just says, lion. <laughs> Humanity was at peace with creation. That's just the first layer. The second layer is this, that humanity was at peace with one another. There's no power struggles. There's no uh, strife. There, there, there's no tension. There's no secrets. A Adam and Eve were really the only uh, couple in, in human history to ever experience this, to be in relationship with another human being and to be in that perfect state. They were at peace, not just with creation, but with one another. And then maybe most spectacularly was this, that humanity was at peace with God. 
In Genesis 2, there's this picture that's kind of unfolded of Adam and Eve uh, walking with God in the cool of the day. They're finding their meaning and their identity and their significance in him and in him alone. This is shalom. This is beautiful. This is peace. But all of this is only the first two chapters of the Bible. We enter into Genesis chapter 3, and something horrific happens. Sin enters the picture and fractures everything. And we see this breakdown on all three levels. First, humanity's breakdown with creation. No longer do they have dominion over the ground, but the ground has dominion over them. From ashes we have come, and to ashes we will return. Now humanity is no longer in perfect relationship with others, but now there's, there's power struggle. Now there's tension. Now there are secrets, right? I, in fact, you get to Adam and Eve's kids, you see the complete breakdown of this. The immediate descendants of Adam and Eve, we see the first murder. I mean, it spirals out of control fast, but, but worst of all was not what happened with humanity and creation or humanity with one another. The worst part that happened was what happened to our relationship with God. No longer are Adam and Eve walking with God in the cool of the day, but now there's this complete opposite picture. Adam and Eve are running and hiding from him. Sin enters shalom like a hand grenade and blows it up. This is why today we have wars. This is why today we have uh, sex trafficking. This is why today there's famine and natural disasters. This is why today there are germs that attack our bodies, leading to sickness and in death. And yet, 2,700 years ago, in the middle of all this mess, we have this prophecy from 2,700 years ago, Isaiah saying that Jesus is going to be the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. I think it begs the question, if we just look around at our world today, how can this be? Did Isaiah get it wrong? The answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. But it does, what did Isaiah mean that Jesus is the Sar Shalom? Well, this is what I want to explore with you. All right, you know what, let's take notes this morning. You guys with me? Y'all got paper in front of you in the seat? Find a pen, write down these three points. I have three points that I want to give you. There's probably more than this, but I think there's at least three big things. What does it mean that Jesus is the Sar Shalom? Okay, here's point number one. Through Jesus, we can have peace with God. Through Jesus, we can have peace with God. When sin entered the garden on that, on that day, man, that, that hand grenade that, that went off, what it did is it, it fractured our relationship with God because you cannot have sin and be at peace with God at the same time. Now, that's a problem. Like, for all, can we just acknowledge this morning, that's a problem. What I just said, this is a big problem. See, here, here's what, don't, like this morning, don't think about this at 30,000 feet, okay? This isn't a Bible college class. Right now, personalize it. I want you to think about your life. I want to think, uh, think about everything you've ever said. Think about everything you've ever done. Think about everything you've ever thought in your mind. How is it possible after all of that that we can actually have peace with God? I'll tell you how it's possible. It's possible because when Jesus came on that first Christmas 2,000 years ago, he didn't stay a baby. First of all, that just would have been weird. But he didn't stay a baby, man. He grew up. And in that growing up, the Bible says that he grew in wisdom and stature, that he grew up living the life that none of us could have ever lived. And he also died the death that all of us should have died in our place for our sins. Condemned he stood. 
and he sealed our pardon with his blood. That's how we get peace with God, okay? For anybody who calls upon the name of Jesus gets peace with God. Romans 5, let's look at this. Romans 5, verse 1. I want you to see what Paul says to the church in Rome. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, listen, church, he says, you, for you who have put your faith in Jesus, you have been justified. Now that word justified or justification is a big theological word that, that simply means that you have been declared righteous, that you are in right standing with God. Why? How? Because when you put your faith in Jesus, it's what they call the great exchange. That he became our sin and died with it on the cross. And that is the only way that any of us can find peace with God. You, you, you know that saying? Uh, it's a very popular saying. Uh, There's no atheist in foxholes. Any, ever, ever heard this before? It kind of originated out of the war, but... It's, it's really this idea that um, when you're presented with uh, the reality that, that you are going to die, and maybe that's a, a more acute situation, um, and you know that like, you might be nearing the end, there's this thought. For most people, there's this thought that goes through your head. How do I know that when I die, I'm going to be at peace with God? Right? There's no atheists in foxholes, Right? How do I know that when I die, I'm going to have peace with God? And can I tell you, I've been pastoring for 15 years. And during that 15 years, I have watched this over and over and over again. When life throws you the sucker punch that you didn't see coming, when you get that phone call from the doctor that you didn't want to hear, the diagnosis that came, it's amazing how many people in that moment, one of the first things that goes through their head is, if this is true, that I'm coming to the end, if this is true, that the doctor's right, how do I know that when I die, I'm going to have peace with God? Here's the good news. I have the answer, okay? The only way, the only way in this life and in the one to come, the only way that you can have peace with God, rest assured in your soul, that you can have peace with God is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. The only way. It is the only way. This is through Jesus we have peace with God. And if that was all that Jesus ever did for us, it would be enough. It would be enough, but it's not all that he's done for us. Here's my second point is this. Through Jesus we can have peace within. Within, there's so much on this side of eternity that if we're not careful, can just rob us of our joy and inner peace. Like so much, why? Because nothing really seems to work perfectly on this planet. The weather doesn't work perfectly. The economy doesn't work perfectly. Our relationships Friendships, marriages don't work perfectly. I mean, even your plan for your life. I doubt there's a single person listening to my voice that your plan for your life has actually worked out perfectly. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but your body doesn't work perfectly. Right? Like, like the reality is nothing on this side of eternity really works the way that it's supposed to. Why? Going back to Genesis chapter 3, right? It's fractured. We live on a broken planet in broken bodies in this reality. This reality of, of this broken world that we're in is so prevalent that it even shows up in the Christmas carols that we sing at this time of year. You know, one of my, one of my favorite songs, I, I think my wife grows sick of it every Christmas because it's just, it's always on my playlist. But uh, the song, I, I Heard the Bells, anyone know this song? It's great. Mercy Me, hands down, is the best version of this. Uh, it was actually written not as a song, but as a poem. 
by Henry Longfellow in the year 1863. And I want you to listen to some of the words that he wrote. 1863, he looks around at the world and he wrote this. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And that's in 1863. 1863, he looks around and has this moment of despair saying, man, hate is strong. If I can just be transparent for a moment, man, there there are just some days that I completely get what Henry's saying. There's just some days, man, I, I wake up, I watch the news, or I go to Costco at Christmas time. <laughs> I was there last night. Oh. And it's this reminder, <laughs> man, hate is strong. <laughs> <laughs> it mocks the song of Christmas, right? Like, and the reality is, like, we've all been there. We, we, we've all had this awakening on some level, but then there's these moments by God's grace and God's grace alone that he reminds me of who he is and what he has done and what he's promised he's going to do. And it doesn't make all the pain around me go away, but what it does is it brings peace to my heart and my mind in the middle of the pain. You understand? What I wanna do, I wanna show you this. Go with me in your Bibles to John chapter 20. If we fast forward 33 years after that very first Christmas, Jesus has just died a brutal, horrific death by the Romans, crucifixion on the cross. Well, what this does is this sends the disciples, his followers, into panic, like all-out panic. So what they immediately do is they barricade themselves in a locked room for fear, right? Because if they could do that to Jesus, if they could do that to the one Uh, who can feed the thousands with next to nothing, cast out demons, if they can do that to him, man, what are they going to do to us? So they, they barricade themselves in a locked room, and then this happens, John 20, verse 19. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, say suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. I love that. It does not say suddenly Jesus picked the lock. It's not suddenly Jesus came down the chimney like Santa Claus. No. Suddenly, the resurrected Jesus appears miraculously in the room with his followers. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. Oh, I see what Jesus has to offer, Parkwood, is not just peace with God. It is peace within. It's peace within. It's important that we realize that peace on this side of eternity does not mean uh, the absence of pain. No, 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 no. It's the presence of God. Okay? Peace is a person. And peace has a name. 2,000 years ago, the resurrected Jesus showed up miraculously in a room full of worried, anxiety-driven disciples. And what he does is he speaks his presence over their pain. Listen, I don't know what you're facing going into this Christmas. I don't know what struggles you have. Maybe there's division in the family. Maybe there's not enough uh, money uh, going into Christmas, you don't know how you're going to pay for gifts for your kids. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one, and this is really the first time you're going to go through the holiday season with an empty uh, chair at the table. Listen, 
Peace is not the absence of pain. Peace is a person. And in this moment right now, I want you to hear the same message that Jesus spoke over his disciples twice. Parkwood, peace be with you. Peace be in you. Oh, the good news that we have this Christmas is not that everything is just going to miraculously work itself out this Christmas. I, I, I cannot promise you that. But what I can promise you is that in Christ and in Christ alone, you can have a peace within that somehow supersedes all of the trials around you. Jesus comes so that we can have peace with God. Jesus comes so that we can have peace within. And then my third point is this, that through Jesus, we will have peace on earth. (laughs) Henry Longfellow, in the year 1863, looks around at his world. says, and in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong, and it mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And for a moment, it seems like all hope is lost, but only for a moment, because that's not the end of the poem. That's not the end of the song. He immediately goes on to write these words. Listen to this. He says, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, good will to men. Oh, come on. He looks around. He sees the brokenness. How can Jesus be the prince of peace? But then he remembers, wait a minute, God's not dead? Wait a minute, he's not asleep at the wheel? No, no, no. And one day, one day, Parkwood, he will come back to bring peace on earth. This is the good news that we have. Worship team, come on back up. I'm going to help, help me land this plane. Um, I, I, I want to take us to the end of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22. And, and I realized that um, I just got out of a series last month teaching on the afterlife. And so some of what I'm going to say right now is a little bit of a revisit of that. But it's so important because this is really the hope that we have to remind ourselves of at Christmas. Revelation 21 and 22, we get a future picture of peace on earth. Hasn't happened yet. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. John sees, he has this vision of the city of God coming down out of heaven to earth. Now, this is important. Why? Because for anybody who calls upon the name of Jesus, this is your future home. Okay, so let's, let's listen and pay attention here. Revelation 21, we'll pick it up in verse 25. He writes this, that its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no more night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So you got to see this picture. John, John is this vision, the city of God coming down from heaven to earth. It is our final dwelling place. And he says, and on that day, which you have to understand, John says that the gates of heaven on earth will never be shut. Now here's why that's important. You see, ancient cities, they were protected by large walls and strong gates. Those gates would be open during the daytime and only during the daytime. During the daytime, people could come, they could leave, commerce, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, but at night, never would those gates be open. At night, what you do is you, you lock those gates, you fortify those gates, you, you arm those gates with military personnel. Why? Because at nighttime, out come the thieves. 
out come the crooks, out, out come those who come to steal, kill, and destroy. But on this day, in this picture of our eternal home, it says that the gates of heaven will never be shut. Why? Because on that day, there's no evil to keep out. You, you see the picture? On that day, shalom will have finally come to earth. I want to show you one more. Let's stand on up to our feet. One more text this morning, Revelation 22. He goes on to say this about our eternal dwelling place. It says this, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will, they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Parkwood, in the beginning, God made everything shalom. Shalom, sin enters in like a hand grenade, blows it up, and quite literally, a curse was placed upon everything that we know. This is why we have earthquakes, and tornadoes, and hurricanes. This is why we get sick. Like, like, this is our reality. But what John just showed us here at the end says, no longer will there be any curse. Like, there is a day coming when the curse will be lifted. And on that day, shalom in its beauty, in its wholeness, in its perfection, the way that it was meant to be in the beginning will finally come back to earth. I'm just wondering, is there anybody longing for that day? Oh, come on, this is the hope that we have at Christmas. Parkwood, there is hope. Jesus is our wonderful counselor. Jesus is our mighty God. Jesus is our everlasting Father. Jesus is our Prince of Peace. Through Jesus, we can find peace with God. Through Jesus, we can find peace within in the darkest imaginable season. And through Jesus, one day there will be peace on earth, just like there was in the beginning. Park with there is hope this Christmas. And it is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. So I don't know what you need right now. M maybe you're here and you honestly don't know that if you were to die today that you would have peace with God. You, you're just not aware of that. And, and if that's you, friend, brother, sister, let me just help you with that. This is the easiest and most important decision that, that you can ever make. What it is is just saying, I'm done doing it my way and God, I wanna do it your way. God, I'm gonna put my faith and my trust and my hope in you and you alone. And if you're there, all you have to do is lift up your song, lift up your voice and call upon his name in salvation. Peace with God can be yours today. Maybe you're here and just, if you're honest, just going into Christmas, you just don't have peace within. It's like the wind and the waves of the storm around you. It's gotten so strong, the waves have gotten so high that you're not able to see Jesus accurately. And what I'm praying is by God's grace this morning that he would help you see clearly. I cannot promise you that your pain's gonna go away, but what I, cannot, but what I can promise you is that there's a peace. There's a peace that can come your way this Christmas just by, again, just surrendering to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Or maybe you're like Henry Longfellow in the stanza of that poem and you look around at the world and just right now you just feel like you're in despair. I'm praying by God's grace that we would get to the next stanza of that song and that you would see this morning that God is not dead, nor does he sleep. 
He is working on our behalf right now, and there is coming a day when shalom will be restored. Parkwood, Jesus is the answer this morning. You know, we often say, you know, it's a little bit cliche, but, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season. It's true. <laughs> it's just true, man. It's, it's in him. All the hope we have is found in him and in him alone. So